Now to another social ill, which is child illiteracy, and a glimmer of hope from one of America's poorest states. Mississippi has a long track record of educational failure, but after a major reform initiative, kids there are showing significant progress in school, which New York Times columnist Nicholas Kristof highlights in an article called Mississippi is Offering Lessons for America on Education. Kimiana Burke helped implement reform when she was head of teaching and learning in Jackson, and they both spoke with Michelle Martin about how Mississippi's approach can work for children all over the world. Thanks, Christian. Nicholas Kristoff, Kimiana Burke, thank you both so much for joining us. Great to be with you. Thank you for having me. Nick Kristoff, I'm going to start with you. You've been reporting a series called How America Heals, in which you've been digging into some of the more challenging issues that America faces. And that reporting took you to Mississippi, where you have been examining gains that they've made in, in literacy, especially for kids in the third grade. So what brought you to Mississippi and, and why did you and what did you find there? Well, I guess I see so many problems around the US that have to do with education. And I don't, you know, I think the best metric for where society will be in 25 years is a state of K through 12 education today. And in the US as a whole, that, that is deeply problematic. People kept telling me that I should go to Mississippi. And frankly, you know, I didn't entirely believe it. You don't normally think that you're going to find solutions to social problems in Mississippi of all places. But I went and I was truly kind of blown away by what I found. And I do think that there are lessons in Mississippi for the rest of the country having to do with making sure that kids learn how to read, learn how to do math, uh, raise high school graduation rates and really focus on improving education. I mean, you start your piece by saying the refrain across much of the Deep South for decades was thank God for Mississippi. That's because, however, abysmally Arkansas or Alabama might perform in national comparisons, they could still bet that they wouldn't be the worst in America because that spot was often reserved for Mississippi. So just to sort of give you, you know, some context about why people say that, what did you find in Mississippi that was so remarkable? So Mississippi has dramatically improved uh, fourth grade reading and math results in particular. And that is true, you know, despite the fact that it hasn't solved child poverty, it hasn't solved uh, racism. But, you know, in fourth grade among, uh, so it's gone from just about the bottom to about the middle of the country in fourth grade scores. And if you look at children in poverty, which is an area where the U.S. does particularly poorly, Mississippi has done remarkably among uh, low income children, uh, fourth grade uh, Mississippi kids now rank or uh, tied for best in the country in reading and uh, second in math. Uh, and I guess what strikes me is that, you know, look, Mississippi hasn't solved these broader social problems, still worse in the country in child poverty, but it has figured out how to get kids to read. And the rest of the country has to, you know, learn what we can from what Mississippi is doing. Kimiana Burke, let me turn to you. You were born and raised in Mississippi. When you were growing up, did you have a sense of the thing that we were talking about at the beginning of our conversation, that, that, that Mississippi wasn't supposed to be a place where people excel academically, especially black kids? Yeah, of course. You know, and my, I myself, I grew up in a low income area um, and, you know, I'm public school student, um, you know, throughout. So, yes, I was very well aware, as many of us were, you know, in, in the country that we were last and that as long as there had been a ranking, Mississippi was last. Um, and, and I think that what is so remarkable about where we are now is that, you know, I always say it had become OK for Mississippi to be last and it had become OK in a sense to Mississippians. What made it stop being OK? What made it stop being okay and for people in Mississippi to say that's not good enough anymore? Well, in 2013, our former governor, Bill Bryant, who was dyslexic, um, decided to have this huge education reform package, which not, which not only included literacy, it also included early learning collaboratives, um, which would be the state's first investment in early childhood education and in four-year-old education from the state agent from the state. Um, but then also we had an accountability model. So we had several things going on with education reform. And you know, I always say that we were at the point where I, I feel it was we're gonna go big or go home. And this was our first state-led effort 
on just a major scale to reform education and to start with the most basic of things, which is literacy and being able to read. Hmm. Nick, I'm going to go back to you on this. What was the thing that was the driver here? Well, I'd say the stage was maybe set in the early 2000s, but in 2013, indeed, as, as Kimiana said, there was this major legislative package that uh, set the groundwork for early childhood programs, which Mississippi historically been had been awful at, uh, you know, in pre-K and getting kids especially really needy kids, uh, access to pre-K. And then there was uh, another you know, key component, I think, was a, a real major effort to get every kid reading by the end of third grade. And uh, as part of that, there was a uh, third grade gate set up so that kids had to pass a reading test at the end of third grade, or they would be held back. And there were a lot of reasons to be concerned about that and whether that would uh, you know, hurt morale of kids, whether that would uh, disproportionately hurt low-income kids or kids of color. In fact, I think it created accountability and made uh, teachers, principals, families, and kids themselves care very deeply about making sure they learn to read by the end of third grade. Um, you know, And then test results began to improve. I think that made the legislature more inclined to increase early childhood programs uh, last year to pay teachers more. It created a virtuous cycle of investment. Um, but there, you know, look, a lot of states talk about the importance of getting kids to read. What I saw in Mississippi was a just real determination to use tutoring, to use uh, uh, sort of a career development of faculty and skills development of faculty to make sure they were teaching a curriculum that really would work and would get kids uh, to read. And all coupled with a, um, I think, an administration at the state level that made sure these goals were being implemented in every district in the state. So, Kimiana, you became Mississippi's literacy director beginning in 2013, and you talked about the Literacy-Based Promotion Act, which is the gate, right? And I know it's controversial because it's been controversial everywhere that, you know, this has sort of come up for discussion. Uh, and I'm just curious, as a, as a person who's been a classroom teacher yourself, can you identify, you know, why you think that is so important? Right. So it's extremely important. You know, any of the research that you um, read around that transition from learning to read to reading to learn shows that that transition from third grade to fourth grade is extremely important. There's so much scaffolding that's done between kindergarten and third grade where students are um, learning to read. Right. They're learning all of the foundational skills. Once they enter fourth grade or when they enter fourth grade, the text becomes a lot more complex. And for those students who do not have really a stronghold of those foundational skills, it becomes extremely difficult for them um, to be able to transition and, and to be successful in those upper grades. So it's important because just historically or across the country, there really hasn't been any accountability in kindergarten through second grade. Our state assessments begin in third grade, right? So even though we call this a third grade gate or read by three policies or any of the uh, other terms that you may hear, this is not just a third grade teacher's responsibility. And I think that that's the important lesson here, that when students enter kindergarten, we are supposed to ensure that we're identifying those early who have or who may have reading difficulties and provide them with all of the supports. So with our law, it allows for that. It allows for not just screening students, but providing interventions. It allows for teachers to be trained in the science of reading so that they'll know how to respond to students who have reading difficulties. So there are all of these supports. And so we always talk about it as um, third grade retention as an intervention tool, but mostly that that entire time from kindergarten through third grade is spent on very intentionally on prevention, prevention of reading difficulty. What about, what about the, can you, can you hone in on the science of reading part of it? Because one of the points that you also have made is that, you know, everybody doesn't know how to teach reading. So how did you, you know, persuade people that really focusing on research-based uh, methods was the way to go? Yeah, well, I think the first thing was that we had to um, create this common language for what it meant to teach reading. That's why professional development was so important. But as a state agency and as a state-led initiative, um, we had to really prove ourselves. 
the state agency had always been seen as this auditing arm. Like if the State Department comes to your building, to your classroom, you know, to your school, then you've done something wrong. So we had to take the approach that we want kids reading by the end of third grade, but we're going to help you get there. So I think a lot of what we did to get buy-in was we put boots on the ground in the role of literacy coaches. We said, we're, we're here with you and we're going to help in your schools to support you in those efforts. So Nick, I, I noticed that the comments on your piece were quite robust. Um, obviously, pe a lot of people were really interested in this subject, but a lot of people were really skeptical. They said, well, you know, you, there, you, you know, the state benefited by an enormous financial commitment by a particularly committed philanthropist named Jim Barksdale and his family, okay? And a lot of people were like, well, shoot, you know, you give me $100 million, you know, we'll get some results too. What do you say to that? So overall, so Jim Barksdale, the founder of Netscape, put in $100 million in uh, the year 2000. Um, if you look at how much states spend on education, you know, over the last 20 plus years, that $100 million did not count for all that much. And Mississippi generally does not spend all that much on per pupil education. I do think that what Barksdale brought was a real emphasis on accountability, on assessment, on rigor, on evidence. And he had influence in the, in the state. I think it was as much that emphasis on rigor and evidence uh, that, that helped bring about the changes. But it also, it wasn't just Barksdale. I mean, it was essentially a state was willing to re think how it did education. And there was, uh, I I mean, Kimiana would be able to speak to this better, but I think there was a certain amount of embarrassment in Mississippi and a willingness as a result to try new things and then to do its best to make sure that these new approaches worked. The question I think some people would have is, you know what, it's great that Mississippi finally kind of woke up and 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 took seriously its commitment to educate every child, as opposed to you know, the long history of allowing people to opt out of the educational systems because they didn't want to integrate or not giving mm -hmm. the same kinds of early childhood supports that other states have long since embraced, like universal, you know, pre-K, for example. And I think what some people would look at this and they think, well, you know what, but, but what about child poverty? What about the maternal mortality rate? What about clean water in Jackson, for example? What do you, do you have thoughts about that? Oh, those qualms are real. I mean, look, you know, Mississippi, you know, the highest child poverty rate in the country. That is a disgrace. Mississippi fails its children with a poverty rate like that. And, you know, absolutely, we should not give Mississippi a pass or Mississippi Republicans a pass for allowing those rates of uh, of child poverty, for the racism that continues to be a problem around the state, uh, for the degree of segregation in education there. You know, on the other hand, uh, around the country, we have an awful lot of school systems that fail kids. And we tend to say, well, uh, too bad, we can't really address these problems because there are so many kids living in poverty and you can't really do much about education for kids who are living in poverty. And Mississippi is the rebuttal for that argument because Mississippi has shown that even if you don't solve child poverty, even if you don't solve racism, then you can still get kids reading by the end of third grade. And so I think it takes away the excuse for all the rest of us, for our failures to teach education, uh, to teach kids to read. Can you, Barker, can you talk a little bit more about how or whether you think these kinds of initiatives are transferable and scalable? Yeah, I think it's, of course, I think it's transferable um, because there are so many states now that are adopting these policies. But I want to make clear that it's not just about a checklist. It's not just about a checklist of things. Um, I think that one thing that was um, really advantageous to us is that there is a hub at our Department of Education. There is a literacy division that is devoted to overseeing the implementation of this law, that's devoted to the guidance that, it, to, that we give to school districts about how to implement that. You also have to make that investment in infrastructure you know, at your Department of Education. This is not a one woman or one man job. There has to be a team that's dedicated to that. And then around the funding for it, you know, there's nothing worse than an unfunded mandate. Um, so around the funding for it, this is not through our, um, our funding that's appropriated per pupil. This is funding that is targeted 
and specifically um, used for the implementation of the Literacy Based Promotion Act. It's $15 million per year. There are some states that are giving $50 million, and, you know, and those types of numbers. But for us, um, with our $15 million, it's targeted to professional development. It's not left up to school districts to decide. Our assessment system, um, other our coaches, you know, other supports for teachers and students. So this money is specifically for that. And for states that are saying that we want to adopt these principles, uh, they have to make sure they're also adopting the fund, you know, making sure that there's a budget for it. So, yeah, it's definitely doable. There are other states that are doing it, uh, you know, like North Carolina, Colorado, Tennessee. There are other states um, who uh, who have adopted policies and are doing it as well. Nick, um, you know what? It's it's you can't help but notice that, you know, Mississippi is a very conservative state, a so-called red state. It seems that the majority of states that have passed these kind of reading accountability laws or reading laws are Republican or red states. Do you have a theory about why that is? You know, as somebody who is a little more on the left, I frankly think that somehow my side of the ledger made a historic mistake and somehow we became suspicious of phonics. And I think that that was, you know, partly because we were trying desperately to be very inclusive and to try new approaches and new things. And um, I think then we became a little cemented in place and um, we were on the wrong side of that one and a little slow to wake up to new evidence about the science of reading and how it could improve outcomes. Then, so, so, Community Park, before we let you go, what are you proudest of? When you talk about our communities and how businesses have um, stepped in, there are communities in Mississippi that had never seen success before. And even when I say success, we know that we're not where we need to be for all kids. We know that there's still a lot of room to grow. But when I say districts or schools that um, had some of the lowest numbers as it relates to proficiency who are now seeing almost 100% of their kids ready and passing our third grade gate. You can't unsee that. So now that you know it's possible, you know, as Nick said in the beginning, there's just no excuse. So I think that it, it makes me most proud that we were able to do it in Mississippi. And I do think that it had to be Mississippi. It had to be the state, the blackest, the poorest state in the nation to show the world that if you invest in people, if you invest in teachers and their knowledge and you support them, that it doesn't matter uh, the income of the family, it doesn't matter whether they're black or brown, that you can teach children how to read. And as it relates to the other ills in the state, I think that literacy is going to be our first step in eradicating those things and making sure that we're able to be um, productive members of our society and be able to participate in the political process and, and all of those things that we need to make our state better. And I just think that this is just the floor. And I think this is just the beginning. Nicholas Kristoff, Kimiana Burke, thank you both so much for talking with us. Thank you.